Namaste. And welcome to another new series. <laughs> it's only the 108th one or something like that. On the fourth chapter of Brahma Sutra. Now, this chapter is entitled Phala. Phala means literally fruit. But in this case, in a scripture, there is usually a chapter or at least a section at the end describing the result of practicing the sadhanas revealed in it. So for Brahma Sutra, of course, this is realization of Brahma. And what does that mean in terms of our experience? Well, that is described in the four padas of this chapter. Pada one, meditation and sadhana. Pada two, the process of death. Pada three, the path to Brahman. And pada four, the result, freedom. So we're going to focus on this pada one, which is full of all these adhikaranas or topics, 14 of them to be exact. And here they are. I felt like we got to the kernel or the core of the topics of chapter four of Mandukya Upanishad because we reached a really good understanding or at least a presentation of non-causality, uh, which is, of course, the character of Brahman. Brahman is senior to time, space, and causality. So there is no cause and effect in Brahman. Brahman is completely independent of all of that, changeless. So how can it become a cause? Or how could it be affect? Or how could it be affected by anything? That is why, for example, Brahma never becomes the object of consciousness. Therefore, Brahman is imperceivable. However, as Ramana Maharshi said, you cannot see Brahman. You can only be Brahman. So for those who are realized, who do the work of sadhana and attain the result. This is, of course, totally obvious, <laughs> but it's not for most people. So that's why I want to go over this chapter that deals with issues relating to sadhana, the process of death, leaving the body, attaining the world of Brahman, and attaining final identity with Brahman, moksha or liberation. So to begin, we'll read and discuss the introduction to this chapter by Shankaracharya. Chapter 4, Pala, Result, Section 1, that means Pada 1, Topic 1, that means Adhikarana 1, Repetition of Meditation, etc., the third chapter was mostly occupied with a discussion of the practices connected with the conceptions, vidyas, of the qualified Brahman and absolute Brahman. Now this fourth will be concerned with a discussion about the results, and it will also consider some other matters stemming out of that subject. To start with, however, we shall follow through a few sections some special considerations regarding the practices themselves. Doubt. We meet with such Upanishadic texts as, the self, my dear, should be realized, should be heard of, reflected on, and meditated upon. Brihadaranyaka Upanishad 4, 5, 6. Knowing about this self alone, the intelligent aspirant after Brahman should attain intuitive knowledge. Paranyaka 4, 421. He is to be searched after. He is to be desired to be known. Chandogya Upanishad 8, 7, 1. And so on. The doubt arises with regard to these 
whether the mental act is to be undertaken once only or it is to be repeated. What should be the conclusion? Opponent. Like the performance of the prayaja sacrifice, etc., the mental act is to be undertaken once only, for the requirement of the scripture is fulfilled by that much alone. Were one to resort to repetition, even though not stated by the Upanishad, one would be doing something not envisaged by the scripture. Now, we quoted above the instructions about the repeated mental acts as contained in should be heard of, reflected on, and meditated upon, Rihad 4, 5, 6, and so on. Opponent. Even so, one should repeat only as many times as the scripture demands. There should be one hearing, one reflection, and one meditation, and nothing more. There can be no repetition where the instruction is uttered but once with the he should know or he should meditate. Well, this sounds like the neo Advaitins, doesn't it? Huh? I don't need to do any sadhana. I don't need to read the scriptures. Huh? Somebody told me, you know, we were taking LSD together. <laughs> and he told me that, you know, there's this Brahman thing and all of that. And so I heard it one time that, Tattva Masi, you are Brahman. And that's it. That's all I need to know. Now I can walk around and pretend to be Brahman realized and all of that and put down all you people of inferior intelligence who thinks that the world exists and all that. <laughs> I mean, it's just so ridiculous on the face of it, isn't it? The idea that hearing just once about Brahman is enough to realize it completely. I mean, this is nonsense. Or even hearing 10 times or 100 times or 1,000. We need to repeatedly hear, comprehend, reflect, and meditate on Brahman until we get it. As we explained in a recent video, the idea is to acquire a certain mental habit a certain momentum of thoughts towards Brahman so that when we relax utterly and stop doing, even study sadhana and meditation, those thoughts of Brahman continue, bring us into tune with Brahman, and then when Brahman is pleased, he reveals himself to the empty mind of the aspirant. So this is the technique. This is how it's done. But that can't be done without repetition. Lots of it. Why? Because we are covered with so many upadis, so many false limitations that say, oh, you are this body, you are this mind, you are Joe Blow from Kokomo, <laughs> you know. You have this title and this position in this organization, and so on and so on and so on, which is simply name and form. So we have to get rid of all that. How do we do that? By contrasting this conventional conception of identity with the knowledge Tattvamasi, thou art that. That meaning Brahman, as defined in Brahma Sutra as the cause of everything else. Now, of course, this conception of Brahman is conditioned Brahman, Brahman with qualities, Saguna Brahman. But realization of Saguna Brahman leads inevitably to realization of Nirguna Brahman. This is my experience and the experience of all the followers, sincere followers, actual followers of Shankaracharya. Because he gives the means in these purports, in these instructions, in these commentaries on the scripture that he wrote, 
even though he was apparently just a young boy, he automatically, intuitively understood all this and had experienced the revelation, the cognition for himself. This is realization. And whether you are a great scholar or just an ignorant, you know, farm boy or whatever, your background doesn't really matter because that realization is sufficient unto itself to reveal all the confidential truths about the ultimate conclusions of the scriptures. That's why we follow Shankaracharya. That's why we have no need to refer to other commentators, including other contemporary teachers who may have different views and who may even support them by logical reasoning and so on. But we don't want our understanding, which is straight from Shankaracharya, to be influenced in any way by outsiders, right or wrong. Uh, we don't want anything to come between us and the source of this knowledge. Because without the instructions of the scriptures, there would be no way to know that Brahman even exists. The farthest that the human mind, the human intelligence can penetrate is the necessity for a controlling God, Ishwara, the master even of Maya, who by his desire controls the creative activities and changes and evolution of Maya, of the universe, of existence. What we call existence is actually non-existence because it's changeable. It changes out from one thing to another. It starts with birth and ends with death. And we see this reflected in everything in this world, isn't it? So how can this stand as real before the actual reality, which is changeless, timeless, and supreme. See, this is the point. And this has to be meditated on all the time so that we don't mistake the effect, uh, the world, from the cause, Ishwara, and ultimately Brahma. When it is said in the Upanishads that he desired to become many, he desired to be born. That doesn't mean Nirguna Brahman. That means Saguna Brahman decided or desired. This is called Icha Shakti. Icha Shakti is already Maya huh? because Nirguna Brahman doesn't have desires. What to speak of? being in control of anything. <laughs> there is nothing else but Brahman to be in control of. The whole existence, this whole universe of being and becoming is Maya. It doesn't really exist. It's beautiful. It's surprising. Sometimes entertainment and sometimes terrifying. But in all cases, Maya is doing everything. And Shiva, Ishwara, is simply desiring. But Brahman is beyond it all. Yet we can realize him by following the instructions in the scriptures. Om Tatsa, Om Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.